This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages in growing. Now, please enjoy this message. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. You can have your seats. Oh, my. Thank you. I was determined not to cry this morning. Last couple of times, you guys going to reduce me. I got crying right before I preached. Feel good today. I'm not crying. But uh, you guys all right? Yeah. So, uh, wow. Just, uh, what's that 30 minutes up there for? That's not for me. Whew. I was like, what are you thinking? For those of you that know Pastor Dan and you've been with him, we put that on there because he'll say, turn to 1 Corinthians 7, and then we give him 30 minutes to get to read it. (laughs) Go sit down. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. So, uh, no, I really have a whole lot on my heart, and I thought 30 minutes is going to be tight. So, but, but I won't be crazy long. It's Sunday morning. The whole scriptural reason for gathering on Sunday, it's not just because you're part of Harvest Chapel, you're a Christian, you should go to church. Man, let's go deeper than that. Let's go deeper than trying to find a church to attend. We're here for the purpose, and we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together in order that we would stir one another in love and good works. Now, you know what that actually means? That means that you live outward, that you live expressive. That you actually live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in faith in Christ Jesus. So we're here to stir you up that you would live your life in Christ. Not just pray to him for stuff to go well, but live your life in Christ. Like there's a big difference between having a a prayer list of needs and things you like God to do for you, which isn't wrong, and living your life in Christ. Some people don't even really have a communion I've learned over the years. I said this the other day to a friend and and, uh, I got a little emotional. In my years of pastoring, I asked questions a lot. I found that 90 some percent of people that are Christians, 90 some percent, have never initiated the love of God in their life, acknowledged it or communicated with him about his love for them and how he sees them. And how he's forgiven them and have never exchanged that just alone in their own time and initiated that. Just driving their car. Father, thank you for loving me. I so appreciate your love for me. How you washed me clean and you made me free. We're waiting to feel free. To believe we're free. Instead of just going to God and thanking him that he loves us, etc., etc. Right? So, so uh, some of these things, the reason I'm talking about it is because of what's on my heart. It's right where you started. I mean, you, you, you know, you guys shared the story about the pastor I heard about it the morning it happened, and that's real, that's loss, that's, that's tough. Pastor said many of you guys have been going through some sickness and stuff. Our families just went through, my mother was just did a little thing in the, or my mother-in-law just did a little thing in the hospital. Uh, my son and his wife aren't here this morning. He's been just battling through something all week, didn't want to come, didn't be around people. So there's stuff going on. My brother... My brother, in the middle of October, just just stopped breathing and fell over dead in a butcher shop. And it's real. It's real. There's loss there. Nobody's minimizing that, but it's never to be dominant. Our life is here for a way higher reason than the things we experience while we're here. And I'm going to communicate that today clearly. There's so much scripture on it. It's the the whole gospel is scripture on enduring. Enduring, enduring. I can show you so many scriptures that have the word enduring in the New Testament that we're to never have an option to grow weary and well-doing, to lose sight of faith, to get discouraged, disheartened, defeated, to quit, to grow weary and well-doing. Like, like you can't come up with a circumstance good enough to stop living Christ when you look at scripture. And that's what faith is all about. See, faith isn't believing just for a new job. Faith is living your life in Christ in the face of whatever. Like faith, the highest use of faith is to maintain a perspective of why he's in you, why you're alive, and you're heading to that day when you stand before him. Like, like we all know this is scripture. We all know that life is a wisp and a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow, right? We know that. We know that time is skating by and it's just temporal. It's just temporal. We know that in Hebrews, they were pilgrims and sojourners are seeking a homeland. You've got to be so careful they don't become Christian phrases. But they become the reality and the belief of your own individual heart. 
or circumstances and trials and stuff and tragic loss and stories, even just the amount of stories you're hearing of tragic. This, this last year and a half, two years, my son-in-law just texted me, said, I don't know if I've ever seen so much sickness and death and, and then so close to home and, 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 with his own mother, now his aunt, all this stuff. But then he texted me this, this victorious uh, view of how he's going to continue to live his life. And I, I was like, that's awesome. Because it's not that those things aren't real. I miss my brother. He was like, we were friends. We weren't just brothers. We were buddies. And he leaves my house, and that's the last I see him. And the next phone call I get, he just drops over. Come on, you're, you're, you're prepared for that only in Christ. You're prepared for that only because you have a higher vision than right now. Like you actually understand what faith means. That's how you can endure. You're actually living for that day. And the hope, let me just say this. I say it all the time. You ought to know that I'm going to say this by now. Your whole purpose of your life is to not get by, get through, and live it. It's to shine and manifest Christ. The whole purpose of your life is the expression of Christ. Y'all know that, right? This is my home church. You better know that. Pastor teaches good. <laughs> Don't get tricked into trying to get through and get by and using God to make the road smoother. It's not ever about a smoother road. Watch, if you're believing for a smoother road, you're already in trouble. Because anything that looks like a bump bumps you. And now you're defined as just trying to get by. There's no such thing as getting by. We're not trying to make it. What's that mean? We made it. No, follow me. I don't think you got that. We made it. We already won. Like everybody I'm looking at, if you're born again, you are going to live forever. The things you cried about in that day, you're going to wonder. You won't even know why you cried. We're just, we're like in the flesh, it seems like a lot of times thinking, trying to live by the Spirit, but we really can live by the Spirit. And there's a place to live in faith, even when your own brother just drops over and it's so sudden and it seems like there's no guarantee, yet we understand, wait a minute, life is from God. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. You say, well, where's abundant life in that? The abundant life in that is to be absent from the body, is present with the Lord, and that's not a Christian cliche. Missing him is real. It should never dominate the reality of everlasting life. It should never dominate the fact that God has not changed. The purpose of your life has not changed. The anointing hasn't changed. The motive hasn't changed. Perspective hasn't changed. Like nothing about why he came to live inside of you has changed. What I've learned over the years and all the travels and all the people around, a lot of people live their life for years and never even give what I'm saying a strong thought, let alone let it become their life. We get tricked into survival. We get tricked into survival. That's why there's discouraged Christians. Come on. He's called a rock for a reason. There's no turning or shifting of shadow. It's written for a reason so that you know no matter what's changing and freaking out here, there's something constant that you can keep your eyes on and live toward that will never change. And that's where victory is and that's where reward is and that's where inheritance is. That's where you're storing things that won't rust or rot. Are you with me? Come on, you got to keep your heart strong. I'm not going to say in this season coming. I, I, I'm going to say you got to keep your heart strong. Yeah? There's so many scriptures. Endurance is what's on my heart this morning. Why would the scripture talk about endurance so much if there wasn't going to be huge conflict in front of you? I'm not prophesying doom and gloom. I'm not saying bad things have to happen. But I know there is tons of scripture on endurance. Yeah? So this Christian idea, I said that a little, forgive me, sarcastically, not in a sinful towards individuals. This Christian idea of just blessing, provision, and protection 
is overrated when you look at Scripture. God never guaranteed me that my brother wouldn't fall over in a butcher shop, but He guaranteed me He'd be faithful. My brother's forgiven. He's filled with God's Spirit, and He has everlasting life. He guaranteed me He'd never change or shift or no turning or shadow. You hear this car wreck. It's tragic. 35. It's real. There's a wife that for a long period of time is going to have to endure the absence of a husband. There's a whole church that needs to adjust and shift in faith and adapt. It's real. I'm not downplaying it. But it doesn't change this book and why we just celebrated what we celebrate. Like we ought to be glad this is real. Because this thing we just heard about is real. But it should never dominate this truth. So I'm not minimizing feelings and emotions. What I'm saying is there is a perspective to get marked in and to get burned in where you understand that the reason you're alive is to live in Christ. The reason you're alive isn't to be blessed. The reason you're alive isn't to prosper. The reason you're alive isn't to worship God. The greatest worship of God is when you follow Him. So you're, you're on the earth to live Christ. The expression of Christ. If God made man in his image and we put off the old man, Colossians 3, and we put on the new man, and he's renewed in knowledge according to or in agreement with the very image of the one who created us, then the whole manifestation of our life is intended to be Christ. So that means in the midst of the loss of your brother, how do you continue in Christ? In the midst of tragedy, in the midst of challenge, in the midst of unfairness. Jesus was done wrong constantly. 1 Peter 2 said that you and I are actually called to suffer for doing good in this earth. The people say, well, well, I just want to know my calling. 1 Peter 2. You're called to suffer for doing good. That not everybody will receive your motive, appreciate your motive, understand your motive. Was Jesus doing good? Well, he didn't get treated good. But he simply committed himself to him who judges righteously. It says you were called to this same life and you should follow his footsteps. Ain't that something? Who committed no sin? That's, he's not talking about perfection. He's talking about never letting sin against you give the right to commit sin. Well, I wouldn't feel this way if well, you don't know how long they've been. Well, if you had, how would you feel if you... And all of a sudden, you're justifying something less than Christ. He committed no sin. He never let sin against him give him the right to commit sin. He never repaid evil for evil. He overcame evil with good. So, so, so we're called to his footsteps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When he was threatened, he didn't condemn. He simply trusted him. Who judges righteously. Now watch this. You're not going to do that if you're not pursuing a relationship with him. You're not just going to in a blind face say, well, I just know God knows the truth. And then you got your feelings all hurt while you're confessing that. Are you guys all right? Look, a lot of times we do things in cliche form. We say things because we know they, they're in the Bible. Your goal is not to know what the Bible says. Your goal is to become what the Bible says. When the Word becomes flesh. When the Word becomes flesh. Okay, so the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Word said, follow me. I've said it for years. You don't know the Word until you become it. You can quote it the rest of your life. People can quote the Word that don't even know Jesus and aren't even born again. You can let knowledge puff you up. Love edifies. So I, I hope I'm making sense. I feel a little passionate because there's a lot of things hanging in the balance. We keep saying how we're in this strange year, strange season, 2020, now 2021. I hear a lot of phrases in the church that concern me. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we're looking too much at signs and times and ooh and ah and, and not realizing what's already here. It's called Christ in me. Christ in me. That the just can live by faith. How has faith changed when my brother passes? How has the truth about the cross changed? See, if I'm living for better days, I'm confounded, I'm stumped, and I draw back. 
If I'm living for perfect circumstances, if I've been praying protection over my family and all of a sudden that happens and I say, huh, wonder why my prayers ain't working. Why didn't God answer? Why did he let this happen to my brother? And all of a sudden I have this issue with God and now I end up, you're discouraged and some, you just lost an edge somewhere because you're hurt. You're, you're in sorrow and you haven't had this real healthy view of life in Christ. And now you got questions instead of revelation. And all of a sudden, another question. Now the next thing you know, you got four questions and it clouds out what your heart always knew. I've seen it happen to so many people. And it's usually a list. Well, you don't know. It's just been a hard season, brother. You be very careful that you don't get yourself actually believing that. That the hard season has the right to change the reason you're here. Because watch this, if the hard season changes the reason you're here, you think the hard season was hell? Trying to live your life outside of why you're here is a way bigger hell. That's where anxiety and fear and self-consciousness and self-focus and dread and worry and don't even want to live and life is too tough and a grind. And that's where that all enters in. You got, am I making sense? Peter said, don't, 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 be, don't be caught off guard. Don't be amazed at the things that you're going through. Don't be stumbled over. Look, your brothers all over the world are going through the same things you're going through. Don't let your story become your reason to be the way you are, whatever that is. Let his story be the reason you're the way you are. You, you cannot allow. Okay, so pastor talked on it. That's so funny. I didn't realize it in my Bible there. Pastor talked about it two weeks ago when I was here. You, you just touched on it in the beginning of your, your message. And I went, whoa, because that stuff's all, this stuff's been burning in my heart for weeks. This whole enduring thing has been burning in my heart for probably the last 26 years. <laughs> Passionately. The longer you're saved and the longer you minister in a level I do, like you understand, the more you see there's a tendency to think certain ways and people have a general mentality and there's like this basket kind of people sitting on. You try to get everybody out of that basket. It's not a good basket. Like, like when you hear a preacher get up and say, we have every reason to be the joyous people on the earth. And everybody's like, yay. And they, they work up and by the time he ramps them up, they got a loud roar in about 30 seconds, but one circumstance away from losing the roar. So we're not trying to ramp you up. We're anointed and called to help you to see. So that your eye becomes single. Because your eye is your lamp. And if I don't understand in the passing of a loved one and trauma and, trauma and tragedy, if, 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 if God forbid I just lose my spouse or one of my children, it's not good, it's not fun, it's not yay, praise the Lord. What I'm saying is you have to walk through that in a higher truth. We're not trying to be okay. Because we're supposed to be strong. We see something more than this life. And we aren't Christians to get through it. We're Christians to manifest Christ. We're Christians to shine. We're Christians to walk in the light as He's in the light in the face of whatever life brings. And then there's this big, is it God, is it the devil? Watch, it doesn't matter. Respond in Christ. When I say it doesn't matter, sometimes it matters in the sense of discernment and prayer. I get it. But what I'm saying is, who's at the root of what and what caused what doesn't change why we're here. So let's not get caught up in the theology. Let's just live the truth. How many times in your pastoral life have you heard people say, but you don't know what I'm going through? Have you ever, Rick, oh my goodness, Rick's sitting right behind you. He just lost it. He just postured. Just, you've heard that before? Is that a dominant phrase? People say, well, brother, you don't understand. I'm just going through this wilderness place. It sounds so religious, so spiritual to people, like so Sunday. 
I'm going through this wilderness, brother. Okay, must be the Israelites' wilderness. Where they were self-centered, self-seeking, and always wanted to go back to Pharaoh's land because they were struggling. What about Jesus' wilderness? Theirs was 40 years. Jesus was 40 days, defeated the devil with the word of God, got ministered to by angels, came out of the wilderness in the spirit and power, and you're going to say to this pastor, well, I'm going through a wilderness place. Mustn't be the Lord's wilderness place. Must be the Israelites. Where it was, what about us? It'd be better for us. It'd be better for us. Well, it'd be better for us. Well, how come God? Well, I don't know why God. Well, I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I don't know how come God, and I was really serious, and I thought I was in faith, and I don't know why God. Well, I don't even know if I want to pray anymore. And I know that's funny, but man, that's not funny. And I see it all the time. That's why I'm half a madman this morning, because I see that all the time because people call me when they're overwhelmed people email me when they're overwhelmed people cut me off when i'm guest speaking and cut trap they wait for me in places (laughs) and you think you're heading to your car and they come out from around something (laughs) they've been waiting (laughs) and they're overwhelmed and they tell you but you don't know what i've been going through And it shows me that our focus is deceived. That somehow we got the idea along the way that it's all about me and Him blessing me and helping me to live my life in a way that's smoother than it was. And if I'm having all these trials and chaos, something must be wrong. No, no, no. If you ain't keeping your eyes on why you're alive, why He's in you and why you're here, something is going to be wrong. Oh my goodness, is it okay? I'm just wound up. I feel this thing in my heart. I feel like it's heart cry stuff. I do this to you every time I'm here. I'm not here that much. I gotta give it to you. Come on, don't get lulled to sleep with a mindset less than he paid for. And don't let something that's real, that has feelings and Reality to it and something you got to taxi through. Be more dominant than why you're actually here. The whole reason we're alive is to shine and to manifest Christ. Don't get mad at your life. Don't get mad about your life. Don't think your life's an accident. Don't, I, I get, my wife knows technology, I do not do well. I don't do well with today's society, with all the internet, all the just go online. You can't even talk to a human being. Everything's just go online, just do this and it. And they're talking like I put on socks. But when I go to technology, it ain't like putting on socks. <laughs> Nothing even works. Nothing even they're telling me to do works like they're saying it's going to work. I, I, I said to the Lord, I, I said, I know you don't make mistakes, but you sure it wouldn't have been better if I was just 100 years ago. But see, I'm just such an outdoor fanatic. I'd have just had an old coonskin hat and a buckskin coat, and you'd have never seen me. I'd have been in the woods forever. I would have never bumped into nobody. So he's got me where he wants me in the time he wants me. But here's what you got to understand. Your life's on purpose. Your life's not an accident. You are the will of God. There's a time to be born. He predestined you before the foundation of the world, and he said, I'll make sure they're here in 2021. Make no mistake about it. Now, I know there's a lot of this. I think we're looking for hope. We got hope in Him. Like we're always saying about the great outpourings and the latter and the former, and we're talking about this great salvation and God sweeping the earth. I'm not saying it's not happening. I hope it happens. I don't think about it. I think about living Christ. Because sometimes we're proclaiming all that stuff because we're looking for hope because all we see is darkness. All I know is my Bible says there's a lot of things that you need to endure. And that doesn't sound like great outpouring. That sounds like you manifesting. Yeah? I'll quote it out because I don't don't want to take crazy long. But Hebrews is an amazing chapter. I always have fun with people. I say, man, that might be one of my favorite chapters. And then 10 more bombard me. So I never, people say, what's your favorite verse? I said, I have no idea. 
I have like that, that the Hebrews 11's in my top 100. That's what I always tell people. So when I have one I really, really like, it's always at least in my top 100. Yeah. Your top 100 is good, man. Because <laughs> number 100's like number one. You get it? It's like, how do you? It's like, you got to have 100. <laughs> Yay. See, you wouldn't get excited like that if you didn't believe it. See, when I read his word, I realize he's fathering me. I realize he's telling me exactly how to walk through the sudden death of my brother. He's telling me exactly how to walk through all the trial and turmoil and the stuff I've experienced and seen in my life like you've seen. So that to where my story never trumps his. And that I'm actually living out my story through the strength of his. That I actually find my place in this little niche called my story and my expression is Christ instead of just, oh my, oh me, not again, why more, what are we doing wrong, I don't know what, how come, oh. How many people have you seen question the love of God because of life? When you question the love of God, you prove you were never rooted and grounded in it. And somehow, you got the idea that his love is revealed through how life unfolds. His love is revealed through a son that's been crucified. His love is revealed that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son. And while we were walking in darkness, the light of the world came. And like a root out of dry ground, he sprung forth. Yeah? That's the love of God. And when I didn't have a clue, when I was lost, and even when I kind of knew and didn't care, he said, forgive him, he's a knucklehead and doesn't know what he's doing, but I'm about to put a new head on him. Take the knuckle out of that thing. I'm going to put a new heart in him, and I'm going to change him. And I'm going to love him like he never made a mistake. I'm going to love him like he's never done wrong. And I'm going to put my life inside of him. I'm going to put my nature inside of him. And he's going to be the expression of Christ. This thing is not about you getting forgiven and having a destiny to go to when you die. This thing is living a destiny while you live. You can't afford to be discouraged. It's a lie from hell. Discouragement has self-centered attachment. You can only discourage self-centeredness. When you seek first the kingdom of God, man, it's on the wall in this house. What? Man, make sure that doesn't become a Sunday phrase because you know it's Matthew 6.33. That's got to be our lives. Seek what? What? The kingdom and how the kingdom works and why the kingdom works and what the kingdom's working. Seek that first. And his righteousness. Why his righteousness? Because you need to continually see how he sees you. So you see yourself clear and have a good look at others. Yeah? Come on. Is this in your Bible? Seek what? I'm not sure. I'm not... I'll look up. I'm not talking to you specifically, individually. I'm not sure how many of us are taking that solely to heart and seeking first the kingdom. I think we seek our well-being. I think we seek our protection. And I think we live out of how we feel, out of how those things are unfolding. And then we pray and ask God to change it because it's hurting us, bothering us, making us sad, or making us afraid. So 90% of our approach to God is driven by trouble, hoping He changes trouble. That's zero Christianity. It's not scriptural at all. There's no faith in it because it's self-centered. And it's not about the kingdom at all. It's about you having better, to do better, to feel better. Zero kingdom, zero faith, zero Christianity. And it's a priority way that I've watched people live for the 26 years I've been saved that are sincere, that see their need for a Savior, and they love Jesus the best they understand Him. I'm not saying anybody's not saved. I'm saying it's a deception. My people are destroyed for the lack of... Watch. My people are destroyed for the lack of... Does it say my people are destroyed because of the devil? My 
My people are destroyed because I'm sovereignly choosing to put them through that right now. My people are destroyed for the lack of. So let's get the knowledge and stop certain destruction. So what scriptures tell me is I don't ever need to lose a step. Even if I lose a brother. Are you with me? That, that, it hurt losing my brother. I cried. I cried harder than probably any time since I've been saved when my brother died. It's not wrong to cry. It's, Paul said we aren't those who grieve as if we're not those who grieve as if we have no hope. He didn't say we don't grieve. He said we don't grieve as if we have no hope. When he says as if we have no hope, what's he talking about? Everything I'm saying this morning. That's your hope. That one day this thing will be a wrap. And we lived it for his name. We didn't compromise. We were these Hebrew 11 people in an old covenant that didn't even, couldn't even reach these promises that are in front of us. And they surrendered their life. Some of them didn't even seek deliverance so they could obtain a better resurrection. I mean, we, we think we have hardship. These people lived in caves. They were destitute. They were sawn in two. They were burned on stakes around Jerusalem, like burned on stakes around Rome and places. They were, there were so many Christians crucified and burned on stakes. But they were so strong and so committed and so surrendered. I mean, can you imagine how much you must believe if you won't compromise and you know they're going to pour oil all over you? Study history. They're going to soak you in oil, tie you to a pole, and light you guys like matches. And stand there and laugh as you scream. You must believe something to not renounce it. Nowadays, we just get saved to go to heaven. Marriage is in trouble. I better go to church and start reading my Bible, hoping he heals our marriage. Then what? Because without him, it's not healed anyway. I don't care what you say. Lose my job, I'm going to church. You get your job back. And then you think going to church, God was pleased, you attended church, the next time your life's in trouble, you attend a service. I'm just saying, I've been around this. He's not our genie in a bottle, he's not our busboy, he's not our table waiter. He's our father. And we came forth from him. That's what the word father means, come forth from, with a purpose. And if you don't pursue that purpose, your life will never know the rest that the Bible talks about. You're looking for superficial peace, not supernatural, if you're living it outside of what I'm saying this morning. See, peace is in Him. Somehow we get the idea that we got all this turmoil and chaos and we're all freaking out and He just goes, oh, peace. See, isn't that how it works? No. He enlightens me and changes what I see. It changes what I see. And what I see changes me. Two places I can show you in the Bible where faith leads to the salvation of your soul. That means the restoration and redemption of your mind, will, and emotions. Because it's been all shambled through Adam. Self-centeredness really corrupted us, guys. Self-centeredness took its toll big time. Nobody had the practice to be angry. Nobody had to study frustration. You didn't have to nail down disappointment and stay up late to accomplish it. Those things are called the children of selfishness. Everything has children. Everything's trying to reproduce after its own kind. Every seed. It's the first law in your Bible. Don't you think it's the first thing the counterfeiter and deceiver would try to mess with and twist? Yeah? I got to... How much time do I have? What's too late? No, I just need to know. You tell me. No, no. No, no. No. 
11.30? Can we handle 11.30? Sure. I just got to cover a couple of scriptures. I'm just crying out my heart and I feel like I'm going bonkers right now. I got so... We okay? Can we handle a little bit? I mean, because you got children and stuff. Are you sure? Okay, we got a zealous pastor. Are you guys okay? If you get done before me, I slip out, but I hope you can stay. I got to show you these scriptures. Because, see, Paul says we're in a race. Paul says run the race worthy of a prize. He says walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. These phrases aren't accidental. It, it's telling us that Christianity is chock full of purpose and that purpose is of God. So, so if it was just about being saved, big phrase in America, you saved? Hey, are you saved? Saved, the word saved, most of the time it's used, has more of a connotation on life now, life lived, than it does life after. The word sozo has to do with healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound. And watch this. If you don't have a healthy perspective, you'll not walk in any of that. Why? Because the eye is the lamp of your body. So the attack point of the devil is your motive in life. Listen, the devil could care less about hurting you. He wants to stop the kingdom of God. He wants to hurt the purpose of God, the will of God, the plan of God. He wants to erase truth where you're concerned. When the sower sows the word, Satan comes immediately. It doesn't say for your sake. It says for the word's sake. He does never want the word to become flesh. He could care less if you go to church. He doesn't want the word to become flesh. I, I promise you, I know it sounds to some because we're so, he could care less. The devil could care less if you go to church. Sometimes we think that's a way they're coming to church. He cares if your life becomes Christ-like. He cares when you're done wrong and nobody can tell because you don't think done wrong. Because you've been done so right by God that you understand and you've been so forgiven that unforgiveness is never an option. Watch this, watch this. Who would agree... Who would agree that you could go through, sincerely go through the average church congregation and find a reason that somebody hates somebody, cut somebody off, despise somebody, they sit so mad at somebody? Who's ever seen that in the body of Christ? The Bible says he who hates his brother is in darkness until now. Probably ought to talk about this if we're stirring each other in love and good works. If he's the God of light and there's no darkness in him, and he's in us and we want to sing that, we probably ought to live that. Are you guys with me? See, the only thing that will keep you okay in this arena is this understanding endurance. And, and here's what I'm encouraged by. I'm not caught off guard where God's concerned. He didn't like not like, you'll never get to God. Say, Why did you tell me these things? Can I quote Hebrews 10 for you? It's around verse 35 or 6. It says, it says, you ha do, do not throw away your confidence, for it has great reward. Watch, for you have need of endurance, so that after the will of God is fulfilled or done, you can receive the promise. What's he telling me in Hebrews 10? Don't throw away my confidence. Don't let life talk me out of anything I'm believing and standing on and firmly rooted in. Watch this. And I'm never going to fulfill the will of God. I'm not talking about the blessing of God. I'm not talking about the provision of God. I'm talking about the will of God for my life. You'll never fulfill the will of God without endurance. What's he telling me? Things are going to be trying. There's things I'm going to have to walk through, taxi through. But why can't we be in the boat with Jesus in rest? Matthew 7, wise man hears and, and becomes. He hears and applies what he's hearing. Foolish man sits in the same meeting, hears and doesn't apply and doesn't become. Guess what happens in Matthew 7? This is astounding. Same storm to the wise and the foolish and it's not because the wise opened the door. 
That is a major religious phrase in the church. So hardship comes, I just don't know what door I opened. Probably none. Well, and then we get all spiritual and we're praying all this stuff and we're so shook up by what happened. Now we're confounded and we're on this wild goose chase for three weeks spiritually because of one thing. And we call it prayer and think we're being warriors. But if you're not shining, the enemy's winning. All I got from Jesus is, hey, Dan, you're the light of the world. Huh? I thought you were the light of the world. Yeah, but I'm in you. Yeah. Okay. So let your light so shine before men. So they see your life and they glorify me. See you at the finish line. Okay. Whoa, man, I feel that. Whoa. Oh, I feel that. Woo. That done jumped the mic right off my head right there. That done jumped the mic right off my head. Come on, that's what I'm talking about this morning. You got one purpose in life, shine. Well, I don't know if I'm supposed to, and I don't know where I'm supposed to live, and I don't know what I'm supposed to, who I'm supposed to marry. Pick a good one and shine. So now you're all in derision over what you're calling the will of God. And the whole time you're on this spiritual derision and praying and prayer change. And where do I live? Where do I live? Where do I live? Shine! But you're in so much derision over where you're going to live. You're in turmoil and you haven't shined for six months. But you didn't miss a service. Is this okay? I'm not saying don't gather together. I'm saying don't go to church. Be her. But gather together to stay her. Don't do her. Be her. And we gather together to stay her. Oh, this is good, good preaching. Yeah? Okay. Woohoo! So you got all these patriarchs of faith, they're examples. The Bible says we have this great cloud of witnesses. Now I know many people preach they're in a coliseum cheering us on and we're in the arena of life. I never saw it that way. It's just example after example after example after example of men and women that saw something, understood, surrendered, and lived their life the way they should have. And I have this great cloud of examples that are bearing witness of the truth of how I'm called to live. Them doing it, not even being able to reach what I have. They just saw it afar off. Said, you know what? Moses, considered the son of Pharaoh, do you see what he could have done and lived in his life? Being, I mean, you're you're in. He said, nope, nope. I'm not gonna count, I'm not gonna be considered the son of Pharaoh. I'm gonna suffer affliction. With the children of God. Rather than hang over here in this arena of the passing pleasures of sin. I am not going to feed my flesh. I'm not looking for comfort. I'm not looking for esteem in men's eyes. I'm going to step over here with God's people. Because the reason God raised up a people is so that the people of the nations would know who he is through them. That got failed miserably. And wherever they went, they profaned his name and misrepresented him everywhere they went. Bible. So God said, I'm going to join them all back together. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon them. I'm going to put a new spirit in them, put a new heart in them. Watch. I'm not going to do it for their sake. I'm going to do it for my great name. And somehow we turn this story into all about us getting a blessing. Instead of us becoming what it always was we were created to be. And all of a sudden life is speaking louder than truth. That's a problem because truth makes me free. No wonder I don't feel freedom. Now I'm praying to feel freedom instead of see it. Are you guys okay? I'm just crying out. 
feels funny in the room. Are you okay? No, it does. It feels funny in the room. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. These people were stoned. I mean, I, we would, we would, I'm, I'm be, I know it's going to sound sarcastic, but I'm being real. We would overload present day prayer chains if this was us. How's that? I know there's correction there. I'm just saying plain, please don't be one of these Christian folks that sincerely sees your need for a Savior, believes Jesus, believes the cross, embraces the birth of Jesus, embraces the cross of Jesus, and then misunderstands why. This thing is not about you getting something from Him. It's about you becoming something because of Him. And standing on that rock till the day you go be with Him. Because from that day till that day, you already won. Sin shall have no dominion over you. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has made you free from that. And you have victory every day in Christ Jesus in the face of it all. Yeah? Oh, I wish we'd believe it. It's like, really believe it. The same storm comes to the wise man that comes to the foolish man. The only difference between the two is one saw and became something, the other never applied what he heard. If you read the text, the storm wasn't trying to destroy the wise man. The storm was trying to destroy the house that was built. It's in the context. The storm had nothing to do with the individual. It had to do with the revelation. Do you understand? Maybe you don't. I'm not, it's not a put down. You're in a demonic war. Satan against the kingdom of God. He believes he's the God of this earth. He said to Jesus in the wilderness, it was all given to me. I have authority to give it to whoever I want. And Jesus said, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> Trumped him in the wilderness and then went into the realm of death and came out with the keys to what he thought he had to his own front door, but it ain't his front door. Death, hell, and the grave. Jesus conquered. Yeah? But he's still the prince and power of the air. There's still a God of this world. There's still a way that seemeth right to man. There's still a spirit of this age and a spirit of the world. There's still powers and principalities. Yeah? So there's this demon war. And here's what I'm going to phrase it as and define it as. It's a mentality. And it's self-centered, self-seeking, and it's individual. It can't produce anything. It's a mentality, and it's getting pushed on the people of God. <laughs> Whew, i got to walk this out. Are we okay? You're in this demon war against the kingdom of God. You get to fight in the middle on behalf of the king. Watch. You're not fighting the devil. Your fight is the good fight of faith. Your fight is believing who you are in the face of this now that he came to live inside of you. So now you're fighting the good fight of faith and the just live by faith and it's impossible to please God without faith. He's not talking about getting a promotion. He's not talking about even faith to be healed. I'll tell you, one of the greatest expressions of faith is when you're in the middle of it, man, and you don't know how to see anything different than what he called you to and created you for. And you separate yourself from the thing, and you look from him into it, and you shine. When you're, when you're betrayed in life, and you don't live betrayed, it actually proves you understand. This kingdom war, this, this realm of the devil fighting against the kingdom of God, we're on the chessboard. We're, we're, we're the checkers. We're, why? Because God gave us bodies. Why did he give us bodies? To dread? To look sideways at in a mirror? 
He gave his bodies to act out and manifest the inside. The reason you have a body is to act out. You know them by their... He didn't make us spirits. God's a spirit. God's not a body. He gave us bodies. Don't dread your body. Don't be like, well, I wish I didn't. I don't know why I got these lips. So now you're on your fourth set and thirty, fifty thousand dollars later. You just might be distracted. And you're upset by what so-and-so said at Thanksgiving still. But you're on your fourth set of lips. Is it all right if I get real? The only reason we have bodies is to act out the inside. Your body is the manifestation of what you believe and who you are. So God makes man in his image, gives him a body to stand up and express him. Manifest him. That means to make known and realize. That's why you got a body. Don't dread it. Don't curse it. Spirit, soul, and body sanctified. Set apart till the day he comes. Woo! You get it? I've prayed this for years in my bedroom when you weren't looking. <laughs> for years. Father, I thank you I'm a spirit. And I have a soul that's in total agreement with everything you say, everything you desire, and everything you do. Holy Spirit, continue to teach me, enlighten me. And I have a body, and it says, yes, sir. My body is not a detriment to my life. My body is all part of the package to express the truth that resides in me. I don't see my body as a detriment. It's the flesh that dictates the flesh, the work of the flesh. That means the carnality, that's a mentality. I'm not fighting a dual nature. I have Christ inside of me. My only fight is to continue to believe everything I believe when my brother dies. Believe everything I believe when other things happen. I'm fighting the good fight of faith. And I'm saying... Let's all fight this good fight of faith and never grow weary in well-doing because we're going to reap if we don't lose heart. Yeah? So we got this great cloud of witnesses. I mean, stoned, sown in two. See, today's Christianity, I'm concerned when you read this, we see it and we know it happened to them, better them than us. We don't say that, we don't really think that, but if we talk about it, Woo, if this was our list, if this was my last week and your last week. I just wonder if we're encouraged or confused if this was our last week. Where's God been? Why isn't our prayers working? Why is he forsaking us? Why isn't he protecting us? Did I do something wrong to open this door? And now your conscience is violent. Now you're insecure. Now you can't even have a relationship with him because you think you're not even in right standing with him because you think maybe you did something to start all this. Now you're insecure, your identity's shattered, you're having no communion with God, and you're not on the rock. See, I'm, I feel like when you teach this stuff, it's, it's to help you live every day in a healthy, fruitful, eternal way. To where no matter what we're facing, we see. And when He comes on that day, Oh, we're going to rejoice. You know, it's going to be a sad day for folks. Went to church their whole life and never understood what I'm saying. And then he comes and they're like, oops. Oops. Because in a moment you're going to see, whoop, light, boom, poof. Woo! I don't think nobody going to be like, Lord, why didn't you never answer my prayer? I'd have lived a lot more in faith and produced more fruit if you'd have just changed. Why didn't you have? You'll be like, Duh. <laughs> Wrongly focused. My eye was wide view lens, multiple choice. Wasn't single. I mean, what's single mean? It means one voyage. It's single. Guys, if your eye's single, looking through one truth, one purpose, one cause, how can we be so many and have one mind, one spirit, and one faith? 
Because every one of us are supposed to foundationally believe this. And in this foundational truth manifest all the diversities of grace and, and multifaceted grace and giftings that's in the room. But it should all come from this one foundational reason why we're all here. Because if we miss shining and we miss walking in love, we miss what we just celebrated and what it was actually for. Yeah? Yeah? You say, Jesus is the greatest gift. What, what gift? What, 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 how that, what was that gift? Like, we get a gift from Chris. Whoa, yeah. We always say, you shouldn't have. And in our heart, we're like, you better have. <laughs> <laughs> what is he the greatest gift? He's the greatest gift because he restored the truth of why we're here. It's not just blessings. He's just giving us a new jacket, a new coat, a new set of lounge pants. He's given us a why. He's given us relationship back with the Father so we can get back to the whole reason you and I are waking up in the morning. And all of a sudden, you're living your life in truth and it makes you free. And he who the Son sets free, he's free indeed. Come hell or high water because now he sees. He's on the rock. You get it? So I'll just read this quick. We'll be good. I'll be done. I'll probably be done before 1130. I know, I gave you reason to be in unbelief over the years. See how marks people? See how your life marks people? <laughs> so therefore, because you have all these witnesses, you have these people that were stoned and sawn in two and tempted and slain with the sword. I mean, this, this is in your Bible. It says, it says in verse 38, the world wasn't worthy of these people. What a testimony. They wouldn't compromise and just go through life for their own sake. They set themselves apart, sanctified, and said, we're not going to get involved in the mentality, the chaos, and the pleasure of what everybody else is doing because there's a higher vision, a higher goal, and one day we're going to meet Him. And they set themselves apart, and it cost them dearly in the flesh. And it says, you want this testimony, whom the world was not worthy? Do you know what the Bible says? He who loves the world and the things in the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. Now that's not my sermon. I'm glad that's not my sermon, but it is God's sermon. He who loves the world and the things in the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are the things in the world it lists. Lust of the flesh, just gimme, gimme, gimme. He's my shepherd, I shall not. Oh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's all about me. That, that thing can be subtle, sneaky, just accolade. Just how people see it, just, just, just notoriety, just, or not notoriety, notoriety, somebody corrected me on that. They said notoriety is a bad word. Notoriety, popularity. Notoriety is known for something bad. I got an email about that. I looked it up, they were right. <laughs> I get a lot of emails. <laughs> You say, you said, <laughs> when you preach, you shouldn't say. <laughs> so I get so corrected behind the scenes that when I come out here, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so therefore, we also, but see their email helped me. When they, when they, if they hear this, if they hear this, they'll be like, because <laughs> they sent me that email. They said, you use the word notoriety all the time. I think you mean popularity. Notoriety is like a villain, a gunman, an outlaw. Known for something, doing something bad, not good. I said, ooh. I looked it up. This internet's crazy, man. I looked it up. There's a whole web search on, can notoriety be used in a positive way? And the end result by all these scholar type people that did this thing said no. <laughs> So because I read that, I have that deep down in conviction. So when the writing came out of me, doot, 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 doot. So you see, the more you fill yourself, the more you're this, you're living with this internal doot, 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 doot. And then you got to follow that or you'll bust this all up called your conscience. Then you'll shipwreck your faith. Wow. That's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> I need time. 
So therefore, we're, 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 we're surrounded by all these examples of lives and people that gave their physical lives for this. Let us, let us, come on, let us respond well. Let us respond with integrity and true faith and lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. He's trying to tell you, listen, there's things trying to swallow up your destiny on every turn. There's the passing pleasures of sin. Well, I just want to. You tell somebody, listen, that's not healthy to be feeling this way. But yeah, I know, but they really hurt me and just back off. Sometimes it takes time. Ask Jesus if that's true. Why are you buying time to stay in unforgiveness? Why are you pampering your own feelings and emotions apart from God? What you're doing is you're assuring that you'll be found there again. You ask Jesus if it takes time. Therefore, we have this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside these things and this weight which so easily ensnares us. Uh-oh, watch this. I'm in Hebrews 12, still in verse 1. And we're going to run with what? Uh-oh. I'm not even sure. I'm not against tracks, but I'm not even sure when we get saved through a track that we realize we're in a race. I think we're changing destinations on the track. I think we're escaping hell and we're gaining heaven. We're becoming believers so we go to heaven. I think we better know we're in a race. I think every preacher ought to be very responsible to make sure everybody knows they're dying to live. And if they don't die, they won't live. Baptisms should be way longer than they are. Way longer. Three days later, come back. <laughs> Bring them up. Stone roll away. Now you got new life. And if you don't, at least you know where they went because they prayed. <laughs> Just something got to change, brother. All I know, all I know is my Bible is saying I need to run with endurance this race that's set before me. And I got to keep my eyes set and fixed. Colossians says, set your mind on things above, not the things of the earth. Because you died and your life is now in Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with Him in glory. Faith is going to live towards that. Now watch this. Looking unto who? Woohoo! Who is He? He's the author. He's the one that started this. That means the originator. He's the reason. He's the original reason I believe what I believe. Yeah? He's the author and he's the what? Oh my goodness. So that tells me that I'll never fulfill what he paid for if I don't keep my eyes fixed on him and follow him through everything that he's been through. He's not a high priest that he can't sympathize. He understands and he's there and his mercy and grace is greater, right? But I got to do my part, like Matt said, I got to do my part. When the Bible says if, that's telling me I have a response. Yeah? I'm going to look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher. So he might author this thing, and I might jump out in the race, but if I don't keep looking unto him, guess what could happen? Yeah, but brother, you don't know what I've been through. Yeah, but it's just been a long season. Yeah, but brother, sometimes people just get weary. Where are you getting that theology? Life? Others? People? You're not getting that from Jesus. But he's the one I thought we're following. I thought we're looking to Jesus. And if he authored this thing, he's going to finish it. It ain't going to be without me looking to him all the way. Now watch this. Now watch this. Verse 3. Watch. For consider him. You see how you have to look at him to live your life healthy? And if you don't follow him, you're going to get caught up into everything we were all taught our whole lives that we all call normal. Come on, he came and they looked at him cockeyed. 
He spoke for three years and they killed him for what he said. And he wasn't just preaching truth, he was the truth. The fall of man is wretched, disastrous, and demonic. The fall of man is so far from the person of God that when he stood in front of those that he made, they knew him not. He'd speak and they'd go, what? They killed him for what he said. And he's the truth. Today we fight and fight and fight over what he said. And prove we don't know him because of the fight, because of the hate. You can write an article and just demean and devour and hate, and you don't even know individuals. You just disagree with them, so you, you turn them into something. And you don't even know them. You don't know their prayer life. You don't know their heart. You just interpret something they say or association. I just got an email. A guy said, I don't know if you realize the church you were just at, that they tend to practice this, that, and the other. And I need to let you know because of association, this is going to ruin your reputation. And people are going to... And I'm like, I will go anywhere. I don't care what they preach. Believe if they're going to give me a microphone, I'm going to manifest. I don't... Some of these churches you're concerned about is the ones we should be standing in. But then the church is going to sit back and go, well, look who they're running with. Well, they did that to Jesus. The Pharisees and Sadducees all dressed up in their three-piece suits doing their Sunday temple. And Jesus out there hanging around with a bunch of harlots and tax collectors and sinners, pagan that he is. And they're religious doing church instead of being her. <sighs> Association? Are you kidding me? Look, if people are naive enough and immature enough to just always live by association, then they just don't understand a bigger spiritual truth that we should all know. And we're just going to have to let that work out in the wash. And if a man's going to judge me, let him judge me. I'm not going to live my life to invoke that judgment. But I am going to live my life and trust him who judges righteously. Just because I preach in a church doesn't mean I agree with everything in their bylaws and in their faith statement. I might not even read any of that. Haven't ever. <laughs> I get hundreds and hundreds of invites. I feel like I'm to go here, go there. I just got one from a Seventh-day Adventist church. Would you come and preach Jesus to us? It's just fun. What, so now I go there, and then I get slammed and cut off and ostracized by the body of Christ because now I've shifted and I'm... Somewhat married to Seventh-day Adventists and their faith, and Dan's got a little twist in him now. He was at Seventh-day Adventist church. They just asked me to preach. They gave me a mic. You ain't going to hear nothing that, that you ain't hearing today. They are right. You, you, yeah. you, sometimes you might feel like you got a tough with me just showing up on a Sunday. And, but they, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> Friday night, <laughs> Saturday morning, half sleepy drinker. <laughs> Saturday evening, <laughs> and then Sunday morning, my last crack. <laughs> you just go through one time, <laughs> about once a year, you can handle it. <laughs> Consider who? Consider him. What do you endure? Hostility against himself from sinners. You better consider him who endured hostility against himself. Here's this word endurance. He endured hostility against himself, least you, least you be weary and discouraged in your soul. What's that telling me scripturally? That if I'm discouraged and weary, there's a reason. Because I'm not following him, looking to him, or considering him. I'm considering myself. It's a self-centered deception. It's telling me that a Christian has the possibility, the calling, and the destiny to live and not be discouraged. Why? Because of that right there. Because he's seeking first the kingdom. So my brother passes unexpectedly. Am I discouraged? No, I'm just missing him and I'm at loss where he's concerned. Am I discouraged? Has the kingdom changed? Do I love Jesus less? Is God in question? Are you kidding me? Those silly questions. Are you with me? I'll close with this. I said 11.30, I'll behave. 
There's a lot of scriptures. There's a lot of endurance scriptures. First, uh, Second Timothy 2. Endure hardship. Why not just take it away? Lord thought you loved me. Endure hardship as a good soldier. Why? No one enlisted in the army of God ever again entangles himself in the affairs of this life so that he might fulfill the will and the reason and the purpose of the one who enlisted him. Paul goes on to talk about the farmer. Talks about running a race according to the rules. And then he says, therefore I endure all things. You know what Paul went through, right? I endure all things for the sake of, he doesn't even say Christ, for the sake of the elect. That my life might be lived as an example. That I ain't just writing about this stuff, I'm living it. And follow me as I follow him. Because what I am, I am by the grace of God. You get it? Oh my goodness, that's so clear and good. I got to do this, I got to do this and I got to hurry. Oh, I got to hurry. Matthew 24, please go there quick, quick, quick. Can you go there with me? Matthew 24, and I'll be done, I promise. Let me just jump in. Uh, well, let's just jump in. Just, just, just uh, jump in at verse 4. They're asking about end times and stuff. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. Many are going to come in my name and say, I'm the Christ, and deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that no now, see that no one of you, not one of you is troubled. For all these, see, so don't be troubled by all these things. They must come to pass, but the end isn't even yet. For nations going to rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there's going to be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. Who can say that we've lived enough life to actually say that everything we've read isn't strange to any of us? We've all seen, experienced and know that these things have happened in our lifetime. True? True. So this isn't something we're looking for. This is something we're in. This isn't something we're waiting to unfold. This has been unfolding. It's called the last days. Which started the day Jesus rose from the dead. The last days started that Jesus rose from the dead. Because any day after he could come back, I guess. But he doesn't because of God and mercy and Repent is amazing. It's a whole nother message. And these are the beginning of beginning, beginning of sorrows. And then they will deliver you up in tribulation and kill you. He's talking about wholehearted believers. He's talking about these countries. See, we don't understand this in America. Martyrdom is so real in places. There's people that come to Christ knowing they're going to get ostracized from their family. Knowing that their own daddy is going to want to kill them because they're a believer. Boy, we didn't come that way. Hey, if you don't know where you're going, if you die tonight, raise your hand. Every eye closed, every head bow. Slip your hand up. Whoa, we got one. That's how we come to Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm a little borderline right there. That breaks my heart. What, what would we be doing if it was an absolute federal crime to believe in Jesus? I guess you'll never really know until you're in that position. But I know the people in those third world countries, they knew what they would do. We lose our disposition in a season of trials. In the natural, financially, or family. What would you do if they hate you and deliver you up and start killing you? What would we do if our doors were busting down while we were praying? And they drag the two of the men out of the house and kill them on the street and leave them lay and keep on going to the other doors. Would we hate God? Would we be mad at God? Or would we continue to believe God and understand that this is a dressing room where pilgrims and sojourners were seeking a homeland? Guys, from the time I'm born till the time I go be with Jesus, I'm just passing through. I'm passing through. We put all our chips on this life. We bring God into our life to have a better life instead of a true life. 
And then we're discouraged by our life. You ask the average Christian how they're doing. They'll tell you the two biggest trials and say, keep me in prayer with a tear in their eye. I'm just being real. How's it been going, man? How you doing? Well, it's been a little this and then this and last month. So just keep us in prayer. But we're okay. Praise God. Bless God. We're okay. Just keep us in prayer. And we reveal that we're only doing as good as it's going. We do it all the time with our language. And out of your heart, your mouth speaks. Whew. These are the beginning of sorrows. They will deliver you up. They'll kill you. Tribulation. You're going to be hated by people. Some people just hate to be hated. I don't try to be hated, but if somebody's choosing to hate me, I just need to know in my end, I'm living at peace with all men. I'm not provoking hate, right? Yeah. I've seen Christians evangelize that way where they provoke hate. <laughs> don't be one of them. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. See, you're going to be hated for his name's sake. Mm -mm -mm. Do you see how this can never be personal? It's all about him. You took him personal. <gasps> this is never about what they're doing to you. It's for his name's sake. Watch, watch. This is where you got to, oh, this is where we, this is the end. This is it. I'm one minute late. Ah. <laughs> many, many, uh-oh, many will be offended. And when they're offended, because they're offended, guess what they're going to do? They're going to begin to betray each other. And then because they betrayed each other, Oh my goodness, then people are going to begin to hate one another. Well, you said you were my friend. Well, I went to church with you all them years. Well, how can you? Well, I never expected this of you. Well, I can't believe it. Now I can't even trust anybody. You ever see that on a TV show, a soap opera, a storyline, a movie? Has that ever been in anybody's life? Well, it ain't in heaven. And His will be done on earth as it is there. We live set apart. They're going to be offended, they're going to betray, and they're going to hate. And right when their hearts are a mess, voices are going to rise up. Be careful how you hear. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. See, if you're discouraged, you'll hear through the screen of discouragement. If you're angry, you'll hear through the screen of anger. If you're frustrated, you'll hear. Yeah? Yeah? Everything has children. If you're discouraged, you have desires that you'd never have if you weren't discouraged. And you'll act on them desires because the discouragement becomes you because it's justified. Now you're giving birth to things that are never to be. When you're frustrated, you go in directions you'd never go if you weren't frustrated. It invokes desire. Everything has children. Each seed after its own kind. There's no way around it. That's why you've got to guard your heart. Because out of your heart flows the issues of life. Yeah? The way that seemeth right always leads to death and destruction. So then many false prophets are going to rise up and deceive many. Why? Because they're in position to be deceived because their heart's a wreck. They're hating. They're offended. They're being betrayed. Now they're hating. They were offended. And now these voices. Woo! It's a strategy. Watch. None of it's personal. None of it's about you. That's what you got to get this morning. None of what you're going through spiritually is about you. It's about Him and His name. Watch, watch, watch. And because lawlessness will abound. Here, this whole list is people's justification for not living Christ. Well, you don't know what they put me through. Well, that was so and so. Well, they vowed and said they would never. They're the person I prayed with for two years and they want to turn around and go, can you, how would you feel? Don't tell me I'm just supposed to be okay. This has wrecked my trust life for the rest of my life. I'm never going to be able to even be in ministry again, go to church again. I don't even know why God allowed or how God could let this. Because lawlessness abounds. Do you know what they did? Do you understand what they did to me? Who are you to stand here and say, you're telling me you wouldn't be hurt? Do you know what they did to me? You see what Scripture's saying? Because lawlessness abounds. Watch, watch, watch. This is what it's all about. The love of many. Now, I don't know about you, but your Bible says many. The love of many. 
You see why I'm a madman? Because my Bible says the love of many is going to grow cold because of circumstances and people's choices and actions and how they process them personally. It doesn't say they'll quit going to church. It doesn't say they won't do their daily devotion. But their heart is going to lose what they're here for. Love. The love of how many? Many. He says in Matthew 7, many are going to come to me in that day. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord. Many are going to say, Lord, Lord. I'm going to say, why do you say, Lord, Lord? And you don't even do the things that I ask. That's another many. Many. One day I'm in my bedroom, I'm crying, I'm crying, I'm discouraged, I'm despairing. I'm crying because it's red letters. I don't know about you, but I believe when Jesus speaks. And when Jesus is red letters and he says many, it means many, right, to me. So I'm crying, I'm like, what's the use? Why bother? Why are we evangelizing? Why are we doing all this teaching and preaching? Why am I counseling? If many are going to, and many are going to, woo, many, woo. I was just having a fit. And the Lord said, that's the very reason. You lay down your life and you go full bore and you this and you this and all the things I was saying. Why do we? Why do we? He said, that's the very reason you do them all to the fullest extent. I was like, but why? If many are going to come. He said, so the many isn't many. And I lost it and cried and thought he is in a whole nother realm than my little peanut brain. Because all of a sudden I realized one is too many. One is too many. He leaves 99 to get one. One must matter. I'll bet you one is many. All I know is my Bible says many are going to be offended. Many are going to be deceived, betray one another, hate one another. And because of lawlessness abounding, they're going to justify the condition of their heart. And they're going to let their love wax cold. Watch this. But he, but he, who endures. To the end. You think this thing is about me getting blessed today? Getting a basket of blessing, a barn full, a vat filled by the Lord? Hey, great. That's the Lord will do that. Psalm 67, our God, yes, our own God will bless us. I did not wake up for that. I woke up for that. Woke up to shine. Woke up to keep my heart guarded because out of it flows the issues of life. And endure till the end because he who endures to the end, he's talking about a soulical place too. An emotional place. Healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, and kept safe and sound in the midst of betrayal, evil, and unrighteousness. That person that endures and understands what it's all about. It's all after your love. I've said it my whole Christian life. You know I've said this as long as you know me. If we miss becoming love, we miss the whole point of the cross. And the whole goal of our instruction is love. And the whole reason all this chaos and stuff is happening is because there's a demon war against the kingdom of God. And you get to stand in the middle and walk in the light as he's in the light. So church, let your light so shine before men. Do you get it? Would you stand up? I just want to bless you. I'm, I'm eight minutes late. I'll be 12 before I'm done. And I'll turn it over to pastor and he can do whatever he wants. He's the man of God in this house, the pastor of this house. And but thank you for your time. And I know I got passionate. But listen, there's nothing I preach that's not in this book. There's nothing I preach that you can't live if you wrap faith around it. The just shall live by. When he says the just shall live by faith, he's not talking about the same faith that you believe to get a promotion or get a healing. He's talking about the faith, a perspective we have as his people. That we died to something to live to something. We turn from something. And we turn towards something. And we're in. We're surrendered. We set our mind on the things above. And come hardship, we're going to endure it. Come hell or high water, we're going to endure it. I'm not prophesying doom and gloom. I'm saying there's a mindset and a mentality that will walk you through everything. I'm going to close with this. And I believe this isn't hype. This isn't Sunday morning hype. I just believe I need to say this. To where in the end, through the whole thing, you'll be stronger than when you started. In the end, stronger. From faith to, from glory to. I think when somebody has a true, continued passion in them, it's not just because of the blessing of the Lord. 
is because of the fire and the trials and walking through everything. And you don't need Shadrach's story anymore. Because you understand the fire was never the problem. It was changing what you believe and bowing to something that's not worthy. The whole story of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego was bowing to something that's not worthy. And making something Lord that wasn't. The whole story wasn't about the fire. It was about who they're going to worship. And who they're going to believe. That's why Jesus didn't put out the fire. Sure. I'm so glad he didn't put out the fire because then we'd think that his job is just to make every problem go away. See, if we read the story and we're not careful, we'll think the fire was the problem. No, loving your own life and not believing God's the problem. We love not our own lives unto death. Yeah? Yeah. So get your own stories and walk through them and have passion in your heart because you believe in Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you for grace. I thank you for grace to... To live this way, you said in that day, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Let us have grace, therefore, so we can stand. I ask for grace, God. Father God, I ask for grace to empower us to live this life, to shine, to let our light so shine. And I'm just going to take a step of faith and believe this is possible. You said if I believe it, ask and it will happen. That no one in this room will become a casualty of despair, discouragement, or unbelief in the face of life that... That these truths would strengthen them and come to the rescue. Just like I got convicted when I heard, said the word Noriety and it came out of my mouth and my ear heard it and I stopped and read that email and remembered. I pray, Lord, the same way, the same way these words would come and protect and empower. And God, I pray that every one of us at the end would be found in a way stronger place than when we began. And let us realize this is never truly about us, that we live for your great name. I ask that grace in this house, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Thank you. If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmolerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.